really excited actually to see all of you here tonight. I wanted to update you all on some changes that we are making to the Beyond Belief Network and just get a little bit of what you're all doing, um, your feedback on the BBN um, program and how we can help out. Uh, for anyone who here who is not part of BBN, we would love it if you would donate. Um, any support you can give definitely helps to support the wonderful work that these teams are doing. Everything from highway cleanups to responding to disasters to also uh, food insecurity. Uh, you can donate by texting or FBB to 44321. Um, so a few announcements and then we're just gonna have an informal discussion. Anyone who wants to come and talk about their team, what their team is doing can do so. Um, but before we get started, uh, I did want to announce that we have currently been re reworking the Beyond Belief Network. Um, we are seeking to provide more logistical planning, more grants, more support. Recently, we did increase our, our level incentives. Uh, if you go to the Beyond Belief page on Foundation Beyond Belief's website, you can learn more about that. Uh, teams are now eligible for up to $1,000 in level incentives, and this includes a $200 credit on t-shirts for the bronze level. Uh, we are also, we also increased the silver and gold level grants slightly. Um, teams are also eligible for additional grants during the Heart of Humanism Awards. If you win an award, we roll that into the level incentives. Uh, so as soon as you become eligible for one of those grants, you can also trade in on the um, Heart of Humanism grant. Um, in addition, we have also rolled out a food security project that was rolled out in May. Currently, we have five teams, but in October, we are opening that up to an additional five teams. Uh, we are also having our Compassionate Impact Grant uh, recipient, Food Rescue Alliance, join that. So five of their organizations will be rolled into phase two of that. Um, what the food security project does is gives a hundred dollar grant to each team every single month and that will likely increase in the future uh, that money can be put towards anything related to food insecurity whether it's trying to get um, legal help in terms of understanding where the red tape is if it's for purchasing tables su supplies uh, it's pretty much almost unrestricted as long as it is used for that cause um, so those are just my announcements for tonight. Uh, without further ado, if anyone wants to come up and talk a little bit more about their organization, like I said, we're just having an informal mix and mix. Well, Jolie, we were talking earlier today. Can you, you want to share quickly your uh, tree people? Uh, yeah, um, I uh, went to a tree people event and I posted it on our uh, atheist volunteer meetup. And uh, we had quite a few people who signed up, but really only two of us went, but we worked hard. And it was a total of a group of 20 uh, at Tree People. It was an inner city event this time. Norm I have gone to out in the mountains to a couple of times. And this time I thought, well, I'll go to, to Watts. Uh, they had a Watts event. And it was really rewarding to go and help nurse these probably around 50 or 60 trees that they have planted in these inner cities. And I'm just imagining how green those streets are going to look once those trees finally, these, these trees now are probably, oh, maybe five, six feet. And uh, I also got to meet some of the team leaders, but it was very rewarding. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit different, something uh, different from the food security, of course, but it's also something needed. Yeah, that is definitely something um, that, you know, you're doing great work there. And a lot of our teams do things other than food insecurity as well. So we're just looking to make a difference uh, in whatever way we can um, and would learn, love to learn more about other projects that you might having, have going on, Julie. Oh, well, the other project that I have is the Reading for the Blind. 
And of course, when the the uh, COVID hit, I was looking for things to to do, and and I'd always kind of had it in my mind to to do something like that. And I went online. There's a um, organization, an online site called uh, Volunteer Match, and they have thousands of opportunities. And uh, I don't know how I actually came upon this one, but it's by um, AIN, which is the Colorado uh, radio station for the blind. And I did an audition for them. And uh, now I read three, I, for someone who's not a shopper, get this, I read four different uh, flyers every week for blind people so that they know what the good deals are. And it's kind of uh, ironic that for someone who hates to shop, here I am, I can probably tell you the best deals on everything. But it's uh, also, I believe, and, and every time I, I do the FBB thing, Tiff, I never know how many people to put on there who are the recipient of this, uh, because it is a radio station, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure it's quite a few. And as a matter of fact, just to tack on to that, I have told them that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to move on uh, probably at the end of the year. And I also said that I would be looking, I know they have to look, it's hard to find somebody who can read announcements like I can. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, if anybody knows somebody, they are going to be looking for someone who's willing, to, it's commitment to do it every week. They are going to be looking for someone to do that. Um, to carry on that podcast, those podcasts, it's like four different podcasts. Do you have a link for it that maybe you can put in the chat box? Uh, uh, let's see, would it be a link to the, to AIM for yeah. to their volunteer? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Now, my theory is I don't go around telling everyone that I'm an atheist doing good work. So they don't know that, I, you know, so I don't know, that would be up to whoever's doing it if they want to, you know, if they want to make a point of divesting that. Uh, but if anybody ever asks me, I certainly say, well, you know, I'm an atheist and uh, I'm working with Foundation Beyond Belief and with uh, Atheists United, but I don't, that's, I don't introduce myself that way. So anyway, I don't know if there's a, um, I don't know what the rest of you do about that. It'd be interesting to hear, but anyway, let me, okay, y'all, let me find the link. I'll put it in the chat box. Yeah, thank you. And that way, if anyone's interested, um, maybe they can take a look. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd love to hear more about what everyone else is doing. Um, feel free to all jump in. It's a pretty informal event tonight. Um, I, that was actually an interesting point you brought up Julie, about not introducing yourself first as an atheist and then kind of not hiding it, but you don't really lead with that. I'm curious to see how everyone else manages that. Oh, just just to put in there, the, but for tree people, Evan can testify. I actually had a sign saying atheist, uh, atheist volunteer. So <laughs> I had a photo taken with that. So uh, one of the things we've discussed with our food distribution which we do monthly and give out meal kits to about a hundred families each month. Um, one of our volunteers is very adamant that we put our stickers and branding in or near all of our materials. We've always been good about putting up signage, but it's our land, it's our property, it's our event. I'm okay with that. But there's a bit of a, a critique or a sense that the reason we're so excited to be involved in this is because they're traditionally run by only religious organizations and not all, but some of those organizations essentially abuse the power they have over people in that situation. Um, you have a captive audience that desperately needs or wants food and they'll take whatever materials you give them as long as it comes with food. And so we've seen abuses of this um, in Los Angeles. We see this in Skid Row a lot. Um, a lot of the evangelical groups that go down there and hand out you know, Bibles more than food sometimes. Um, and so we've had lots of conversations about what are the limits we want to put on ourselves about materials. So we've pretty much drawn the line at stickers right now. Like we'll throw a sticker in, um, but like I, I will refuse if we're trying to put our own like pamphlets in that are trying to convert you to become a donor or a member of our organization. Um, but I'm curious if other organizations have thought about this and if you just wear 
a t-shirt that says what group you are, if you try to go a step further to at the same time, having our branding at our events has really inspired and excited a lot of people who didn't think we were ever going to be involved in local community work. We had a, a guy from South America who'd recently immigrated, who was sending videos back home, uh, amazed that the a group called Atheists United was doing a food distribution locally. Um, so anyways, I'd love to hear others' thoughts on this, but it's kind of an ongoing discussion we have, mostly because I have one person who wants to put our stickers on everything possible. <laughs> I can just uh, share a few thoughts. Uh, I'm not involved currently in any food bank uh, and food uh, dispensation kinds of organizations, although I have in the past. Uh, I live in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And the reason I wanted to follow up, because I do follow your emails and all those things uh, about some of your projects, is I just wanted to kind of see uh, what kinds of things that um, a group that we have in Vancouver now, because we can't meet uh, face to face, and we're now going through a fourth wave here, and we all have to wear masks and uh, no public meetings uh, of any size. So we're going to continue to meet online, which we have for over a year, in a meeting called HOV, which is Humanists of Vancouver. And so we use HOV because it's kind of a nice play on words a special lane that we get to drive in. So uh, I'm interested in uh, one of the issues we have is that we have uh, probably 40 or 50 people that participate, but they live all over the place. We have people that live in the Okanagan, which is uh, 250 kilometers away. We have people that live on the island, which is uh, across the uh, Juan de Fuca. We have people that live 50 miles from Vancouver. We do have a core of about 10 Vancouver people. And we've been trying to think of something to do that we can do as a group uh, that can involve the uh, geographical differences that we have. And uh, because we don't all live within one uh, community here. We are a community of humanists, but not in terms of uh, being able to run a food bank. We have done a little work in the past with homeless, but it was always uh, individuals that were doing it and reporting it back to the group. We haven't done anything as a group. So, uh, you know, currently I'm a sort of a semi-retired psychologist that works as a humanist chaplain at a large university and our multi faith center is involved in some activities, but we haven't done that now for a year and a half because our university is on lockdown and hopefully will open this fall. We don't know for sure. So I'm just joining to get some kind of ideas for how we might over a Zoom group of 30, 40, 50 of us that attend regularly, we can move beyond just our intellectual and discussions and the things that we do to some kind of a project this fall. So that's why I'm in the meeting, not because I have anything to report uh, that is that we, that we are doing. It's more to get ideas how to bring together a Zoom community to do something since we don't live together in proximity. Uh, oh, that's okay, Marty. And we welcome any anyone who wants to join us. Um, I think probably the easiest thing, just starting off, if you haven't uh, really gotten into service too much yet, is fundraising. Fundraising is something that can be easily done through virtually, uh, and it can bring groups together. You can do peer-to-peer -to -peer fundraising as well to sort of make it more competitive. Um, what we do is we do encourage groups and the BBN teams to try to fundraise for each other as well. Uh, for example, currently we have a team Haitian Free Thinkers and they're fundraising for Haiti um, because they have family and connections there and they're trying to distribute food supplies. So that's probably the easiest way for a virtual group. Um, 
I know it really is also very difficult to get everybody together as well, but I think that there can be ways where you pick a cause and individually participate in your local area with groups um, in the local area of wherever members are, and then count those, count the impact of that as a group. Um, that might be something you can do as well and kind of make it a competition who who was able to distribute more meals, for example, or who was able to volunteer more hours. Um, and that way you're encouraging each other to, to do service. Um, those are just some ideas I have off of my top of the head. Certainly it requires more discussion um, and more thought. If anyone else has any other ideas, I think that might be more helpful also for Marty. I joined late, but uh, what area are you in or most of your members in Marty? Uh, our group is called HOV, which is an acronym for Humanists of Vancouver, and it's Vancouver, British Columbia, so we're on the west coast of Canada. Okay, yeah, like I think what Tiff was saying was, um, you know, like kind of do the competition. Um, so I don't have, uh, I'm from, I'm down here in Houston with Houston Oasis, um, and we've done something called community groups, um, where just kind of different parts of the city we kind of do like a small group and so, um, so people have a kind of better chance to get to know any, uh, another and maybe you could do something like that and do a competition to see like who can raise like the most cans or the food like that. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Well, I thought about a um, each Sunday, we meet 10 to 12 each Sunday. I thought about putting together something that's based on a book I'm writing, uh, which is called uh, humanism indeed and it is where we're not focusing on creeds but we're focusing on deeds and I thought we might look at uh, some kind of a, at the beginning of each of our meetings have some kind of a contest where you have done something during the week on your own or two or three other people and you've done something that's charitable or benevolent or just share that story and and then at the end of maybe a three-month quarter or half we will put up a, a vote and people can vote for which act or what group and and as a result of that we will treat them to something you know some kind of a a uh, dinner out or something just some way to get the group off of just looking at videos and making comments about politics and religion and get us to do actual deeds as humanists and i will interspace a comment to jolie and the others who don't necessarily share their identity when they're involved in a charitable uh, endeavor, but if they're asked, they do. Uh, I don't identify as an atheist. Uh, I identify as a humanist, even though I'm non-theistic and don't live my life as if uh, the cosmos is ruled by some mythological creature. Uh, I, I think though that I am always very pleased when I go to a charitable function and I see atheists or I see humanists around and they're identified because of the fact we get so much bad press that in a way uh, that we are uh, immoral and that we are self-serving and that all we do is want to tear down religion. And so I think anytime we do something that shows that we do have compassion, and that we are motivated by good deeds and acting good, not just always being correct in our narratives, uh, that we need to do that. So whenever I've been involved in a humanist activity, I always wear my humanist hat and I wear a humanist shirt and people come up and they go, what's a humanist? <laughs> So, I mean, everybody knows what an atheist is and many people really react to that, but it's always a uh, conversation starter. So uh, I want people to know that humanists are out there in the community 
uh, doing good deeds and not just taking down the Ten Commandments in parks, et cetera, et cetera, like uh, a very worthy effort, but I'd like us to know we have another whole way of serving the community. I think a fundraiser for all the FPB groups would be great then because we're out there doing it. I like that you're wearing a shirt that says humanist on it, just as a conversation starter. Um, I think humanist is a, something that a lot of people can agree with, whether they're religious or atheist um, or non-theist, just valuing other people and, and really believing in inclusivity and caring about what you put into the world, um, taking responsibility for that. So I love that you do that. I was going to mention just a couple of things that I thought of that you could do as a group uh, being far apart. You could do uh, there are always a need for community contact like people in old uh, elder people and people in the community to just give calls and you can find that on different places, you know, look, look for help with community contact. Um, and then there's also an abundance of science. Uh, 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 community science projects that people can take part in. Could you repeat that last one again, Julie? I didn't get that. Yeah, um, citizen science projects. Citizen science projects. You can look that up. There's a million of them. Any interest? Maybe you'll discover a star or a planet, another planet. And they'll name it after me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, well, they already know. have a famous uh, astronomer named Shoemaker, and there's a Shoemaker Comet, and there's a Shoemaker this and a Shoemaker that. So I would be only one of many. Actually, well, Jolie, you just made me think we had another. Um, there's an app called um, iNaturalist. And so you can take pictures of, you know, bugs and plants and stuff like that. And so, um, they're, they do a yearly competition to see like what city can get the most. Um, and so we have a team um, for Oasis, like all the Oasis networks. Um, and so we, that's another thing too. You don't necessarily have to do space, but iNaturalist, um, for, like it's a citizen science project. Marty, are there other uh, secular type groups in your area besides your group? Yeah, we have uh, CFI uh, Vancouver, uh, which is the west, uh, the western headquarters. It's it's Canada CFI is based in Toronto, but we have a western branch of it, and uh, they do skeptics in the pub, and they have a few other kinds of meetings, and it mostly draws young people, which is really good because we have mostly a gray bearded and older over 50 group on our HOV and the skeptics seem to draw university students. And uh, so we, we have done a couple of things with the skeptics, but not since the COVID. Uh, we also have some atheist meetup groups in Vancouver and uh, there are some secular coalitions, but the COVID has really put us out of touch with uh, a lot of what these groups are doing, which is why I'm trying to get something started again so that in the post COVID and hopefully we can meet again, we'll have some new energy because there's been some alliances that uh, are temporarily, we have not had any face-to-face -face events at all. Right, right. Well, the reason, the reason I ask about other groups is I, I think um, our group, Count, um, has, has had some success in tapping into the other groups in our area, even though we're, our group is relatively small, but we, we partner with some of these other groups sometimes and have joint, uh, jointly branded or joint uh, projects. And that helps because uh, we may only have a handful of people from our group that are going to that, but then we pull in 
you know, another handful or two from yeah. others. And it, it's a way to, to, to ramp up when you're small. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm less worried about being small than I am getting the uh, disparate geographical groups. We actually are reasonably large. We got over 50 people that come in and out. That's a pretty good size for a Zoom group. It's more our, uh, our uh, locations are often quite far away. Right, so, so when we get back to more in-person activities, um, you may only have a subset of your group that's in the right area for that activity. So you may effectively be small. And yeah. the, other, the other thing I would mention about partnering is uh, I've, I've uh, been very much impressed on previous calls where some groups are uh, describing their large effort to feed the homeless and think doing this monthly, a very big effort. I, I, I envy that. We, we tend to do smaller things uh, and we get leverage by partnering with other organizations. So mm -hmm. say, uh, well, one example, um, uh, let's say Ronald McDonald House. Um, we volunteer yeah. there, but there are lots of other volunteers there, individuals, people trying to get internship credits for hotel management courses or whatever. Um, but even though we only have a small number of us going there, we're working with other volunteers. Yeah. So um, that also takes some of the logistical strain off our leadership that there's already a scheduling system at Ronald McDonald House. There's already a, a tracking system that tracks all the hours that people worked and a whole arrangement for calling off your shift and all these things. So we, when we partner with other groups, sometimes we have less burden on us to, yeah. to run the activity. And even if only one of us shows up, it's still a good activity and we still yeah. add to our statistics. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion because we do have organizational gaps now uh, with ownership uh, since we all are on Zoom and we haven't been meeting face to face, even though we have a board, the British Columbia Humanist Association, we're separate from them now because we got a little too political in some of our videos. And so they made some distance between us because that's part of the educational uh, sub laws of being an educational group, which is the way the BCHA nonprofit wording is so we got a little too political so they separated from us so we don't really have a stable leadership right now and that's we need to do something with that and i think your idea about joining with other well-organized volunteer things like ronald mcdonald house we have one of those in vancouver by the way for our cancer kids right kids that have cancer so um yeah, I think that's a really good idea. There probably are some others that I'm aware of that we could just volunteer to and they would put us in the right slots, you know, rather than us pulling together a whole project ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea, Dave. Thanks. And then if you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. With my, yeah, okay. Um, and then if you, I, I, I agree 100% starting off in that way, starting off small. I think a lot of people think you have to start with this like huge thing and then like that you don't have to, to have an impact like Dave said. Uh, and then you have that relationship with that organization. And if you want to grow bigger as you have more volunteers and more people, you can start building out from that partnership with the established organization and move into other parts of the communities where there may be holes that that organization isn't getting to yet. So it's a really great place to start and, and it, doesn't even, it doesn't have to be the place that you stay unless you want it to be, but you can grow and grow if you're wanting to have that kind of more self-determinated project and program. I really appreciate these suggestions. I'm gonna follow up with them with our 
steering committee for HOV. I have another meeting to go to, and I appreciate you allowing me to share our issues that we're having here in Western Canada for getting some kind of, uh, I have talked about Foundation Beyond Belief with our membership, and some of them have gone on to your website, uh, but you're in the States mostly, and you know Canadians like Canadian things. So I'm trying to get them interested in uh, things that we can do as an association. So I really appreciate your suggestions. And uh, if you have another one of these Zoom meetings uh, in the future, uh, I may try to join you or get a few other people to join. Uh, so uh, I need to leave for another Zoom meeting, believe it or not. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Zooming all the time. Zoom here, Zoom there. So, um, thank Marty, you. if you could hang on for just a second. I don't know if you can, because I wanted to talk about something that you mentioned early on. Okay, sure. If it, that's okay. Um, I'm Claire Wilner. I'm the on the board for Foundation Beyond Belief. And I really appreciate everybody on this call, everything that you do. Hearing everything you do is just incredibly exciting to me. Um, but I, I want to push back on the idea a little bit of stating that you're atheist being up front on a t-shirt or whatever is fine. I don't feel that's too much most of the time. But if I were at an event where there are a bunch of Christian t-shirts, I wouldn't be, that feels irrelevant to me. Um, so I think there are basically two reasons not to lead with being atheist in any way, shape or form is because it really makes the whole interaction about us. And they didn't come there to uh, hear, they didn't come there to have their awareness raised about how good atheists are. They came there to get food or whatever. And if they ask me about it, that's, I'll tell them. But otherwise it just seems kind of like proselytizing almost. It's another flavor of proselytizing to me. And, um, it's also just kind of when, when I've been places where we're volunteering and somebody says, we're an atheist group, it's usually a conversation stopper. And the people kind of, it's the look at your shoes sort of moment, like, okay, super, what's that got to do with anything? I just want my food <laughs> or whatever. Um, so I, I don't think it does atheists and atheism in any service to lead with that personally and really my focus isn't on us doing the good things because that's all about me I'm doing good things and look at me and I'm atheist it's more about um what they're getting out of it I, I want them to get as much out of whatever we're doing as possible I'm, I'm much more concerned with getting people what they need than pushing the atheist agenda, so to speak. Um, and and that, that for me has changed over time. It didn't used to be like that. But as, as I've gotten through this more and done more things, that's more how I feel about it. I'm just curious if you feel that those are mutually exclusive because that's how it felt like you were describing them. What's mutually exclusive? I'm sorry. The idea of promoting atheism or like having pride in an atheist identity or talking about your marginalized identity publicly while doing good. Um, I think it's just uh, you be you. Uh, if somebody, if I'm standing there and I'm helping and, and I'll give you an example. When I used to work at um, uh, freeze nights, at church, it gets, sometimes it gets cold here in Texas, believe it or not, and they open up churches and um, you, they bring people into the churches, give them a warm meal and give them a warm place to sleep. And uh, I would do this in association with the Unitarian Universalist Church. So I would be standing there monitoring or whatever, and someone would kind of sidle, one of the clients would just kind of sidle up to you a little awkwardly and say, so, um, you know, tell me about your religion. And I say, no, no, this isn't Salvation Army. You don't have to, I don't, it, that's not, in, that's not relevant. Because too many of them talking about religion or any sort of faith system is 
part of the price of admission. And they asked me, if they ask me, I will say, yeah, I'm, I'm a humanist and you don't have to try to ask me about my religion or anything. That's, that's irrelevant here. Just eat and sleep and be comfortable. Um, uh, identity is important in a bazillion ways, but when it comes to me standing out there trying to get people what they need, I, I don't think whether I'm an atheist or not is important personally. Claire, I don't mean to interrupt you and I definitely want to hear what you want to, uh, have to say, but um, I just wanted to be respectful of Marty because I know you said you got right. another- You got to go. I'm sorry, Marty. But I'm talking too much. Yeah, Marty. <laughs> well, Claire, thanks for the uh, other side of it. And uh, I, I do think that one should not have a proselytizing approach. It is more, much more passive than that. And uh, it's even when I go to my university, which is KPU, which is where I am a chaplain, uh, I don't proselytize, I don't do any of that stuff, but it is nice to have a badge. It was given to me by the university that says humanist chaplain, because nobody knows what in the hell that is. And it's a great conversation start. Standing, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good yeah. one. Okay, right. thanks very much, gang. Thank you, Marty. I, I'm going to check out right. for your comments, and I'll look for an announcement, uh, Tiff, uh, down the line for other uh, Zoom kind of chats that you have. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned um, that you can Canadians love Canadians. We, while we are currently kind of putting on pause on adding more teams to our Beyond Believe network, we will eventually want to add more. So if you know any humanist Canadian groups want to join, feel free to send them our way. Okay. Thank so you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Marty. Um, sorry, Claire, I didn't mean to interrupt. No worries. No. I was trying to say what I wanted to say without being disrespectful of people who want to tell people who they are. Um, because everybody's got a different style. I just have seen it kind of backfire. Yeah. I, um, I absolutely believe there's pride in identity. There's definitely a lot of pride in, you know, atheists or non-theists doing good out there and having people see that we're not, we're not these immoral people. Um, so I, I understand when groups want to do that as to kind of, um, not necessarily with it, but say, this is who we are and this is what we are doing. Um, and that's fine. I know at, at Foundation Beyond Belief, we always lead with, you know, we're humanists and that's not something that a lot of people really know what it means. And that humanist connection, the way we identify is because it's so broad. Um, even though we are technically non-theist, there are people who we serve who might be religious, especially in certain cultures. Um, and so, they can still identify with that humanist aspect of, and those values. Uh, but yeah, there's no one way to do it. There's no right or wrong way, as long as we're all doing good. Um, yep. uh, I, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to have this um, be sort of a mixer tonight is to see. I can't hear you too. Oh, wait, wait. Sorry. Now I can. I can. You hear me? Can you hear me? My, now I can. Awesome. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to do tonight was to see how FBB can be better. How can we help? You know, you're all on the ground working. How can we help you, support you, whether it's through more spotlighting on social media? Um, what kind of things do you all want to see? What do, what do you like? What do you not like about the Beyond Belief Network program? Well, Wendy's wonderful. Can we all just, yeah. <laughs> Wendy is- Big love, Wendy. The program. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say too. So. <laughs> Well, I, I've always liked the uh, the disaster fund relief 
I've always liked that. And in fact, I would like to know how, is that, how does that work now with the Haiti uh, free thinkers? When, you know, um, when, how does that work, Tiff? Sure. Um, so I, I do want to answer your question, Jolie. Um, I also wanted to kind of give everyone an update on Haitian, uh, um, not Haitian free thinkers, the disaster recovery program. Uh, so I'll start with the update. Um, firstly, we, in the past, we were working with American Humanist Association and we were working to deploy people abroad. Um, we were also partnered with All Hands and Hearts. We have taken a step back from our All Hands and Hearts partnership, but remain partnered with um, American Humanist Association. And the reason why we did that is because we want to provide Beyond Belief Network teams, the ability to deploy in their own local communities. Um, we have teams that are in hurricane areas that are um, in areas where there are a lot of forest uh, wildfires. And so it's easier to get local people um, working on the ground than it is to, to arrange flights and everything to, for people working internationally. Um, so we're pivoting that a little bit more towards the local deployment and also more towards the uh, food supplies um, part of, of the, in the aftermath. Um, so that's just a quick update there. And then your second question in terms of Haitian free thinkers. Uh, so Haitian free thinkers came to us in the aftermath of the earthquake. Uh, and then there was also a tropical storm that caused a lot more damage. Um, they have family connections in Haiti. And even though they are not necessarily in Haiti, it was close enough where we could get a local response there. Um, so we partnered with them and American Humanist Association in order to fundraise. Those funds will be dispersed through Haitian free thinkers um, to their local connections in order to mount a local response uh, with food, water, supplies, tents, clothing to anyone who needs it, um, who has been impacted. Um, right now we've raised over $8,000 in a matter of um, uh, just under a week. So I don't know if, if you have more questions there or um, if that was the oh, answer. That, no, that, you answered it. Thank you. I just want to, I want to add to part of the reason for that pivot to the BB, to focusing on BBN teams uh, being able to respond in their communities is that that's what in emergency management, it's known that local uh, local response is the most effective response, and so that move is 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 in line with wanting to have the most effective and you know uh, impact evidence based response that we can have. So, and then to support the BBN team, like whenever there's a disaster in the place where a team is. I'll, you know, y'all want to respond. I'm almost always, they're like, "How can we do this?" So we're so we're wanting to be able to support that uh, more than we have in kind of the, uh, in the older incarnation of the of the disaster response. And and we saw that um, with the winter storm in Texas, where we were able to get more people um, out there because we had a few teams in Texas. We raised almost $20,000 dispersed through those teams and they were able to purchase food um, during a time when, when it was just really difficult with shipping coming in, um, trucks coming in. It wasn't the easiest to get food to people, um, but they were able to, to do it um, relatively quickly because they were already there. So we may need to keep an eye on the storm that's forming in the Gulf now. But um, one thing I did want to say that I think y'all are doing a really good job at is like um, kind of having, I guess, for lack of a better word, like the theme. So like, you know, you're doing food scarcity this year. Um, and so that's kind of nice because we, um, for us, we kind of have a few ones, a few volunteer events that we do fairly regularly um, anyway, but then kind of having something to kind of coalesce around of this is what we're trying, this is the goal we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and so that's it. My dog has wandered in, so. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that's one thing um, y'all are doing really good at. And um, 
one of the reasons why we wanted to do that was to to kind of have, like you said, a more cohesive cause that people can turn to. We don't want uh, BBN teams to to not be able to do the projects that they're interested in. If they're interested in highway cleanups, if they're interested in um, citizen science projects, we do definitely want to support that. Um, and people can do that with the grants, the grants that, uh, that we, we do give out. Um, but we de definitely strongly encourage having at least a common cause that they sometimes participate in because it's easy to to count statistically what we're doing. Um, you know, how many volunteers, how many meals just uh, we've given out, for example, how many families we've fed. And that leads to a larger effort when we're, we're kind of united in that at least some of the time. And we appreciate what all the Beyond Belief Networks teams are doing as well, because you y'all are on the ground um, and we're just kind of the support. <laughs> so. I do have a question if no one else has anything. They want to say. So one thing, okay. So one thing that's kind of been in my mind for like, kind of a dream, I guess, um, is after Harvey, we purchased, or during Harvey, we purchased a bunch of supplies and we did a bunch of cleanup um, down here in Houston. Um, we still have those supplies and they're kind of between a couple people's garages at the moment. One thing I want in the future um, is like a, a, a trailer or something to put all the stuff in. And that way, you know, like it would probably still live in someone's garage, but you just hitch it to the back of someone's truck or something and then it could be deployed more readily. Um, would that be something like Foundation Beyond Belief would help promote like a fundraiser for or something to that effect? We would definitely um, help to promote a fundraiser for that. And some of that grant money can also be used towards the <laughs> show as well. Like I said, it's kind of a dream wish list, but. <laughs> Able to get um, a, a trailer or something like that for free or cheap if, if you ask out there in the world. That's the sort of thing that a lot of people have sitting around in their yards or garages that they're just looking for a way to get rid of. Um, and so yeah. you might might be able to find one for free. Well, yeah, that, that would be, be amazing. Um, I don't know how we could do that though. I don't know. Anyway, just an idea. Evan, I'm not sure if you'd have any input in this, but um, I know you are constantly just uh, giving out food. Where do you store that, and how do you? I know you, you, you rent a U-Haul, right? Where is it stored when you don't? When yeah, you we so we rent space from Center for Inquiry Los Angeles for our office space. And um, we had to move our food distribution from a Saturday from the first time we tried it to a Friday because the food bank isn't open on Saturdays. And what we learned is if we got any cold food, let's say they have... Uh, frozen meats, for instance, that they give us. Uh, we don't pick the food most of the time. We, we take what is given to us by the food bank. Um, we have to get rid of it that day or it will go bad overnight. So there was a decision to move our program to Friday so we could get rid of all of our food day of. Um, we have had conversations about what the storage needs would be. We probably need um, restaurant style freezers to be at the scale of some of the other distributions locally. Um, we have not approached the organization that owns the building about that because uh, we think it'd be too much and we don't have the resources right now to pull that off. Um, we do occasionally get too much uh, dry food and we have spaces in the building that we've negotiated with CFI for storage, but we can't really hold on to more than um, what would be what could fit in a small hallway or closet right now. Um, and honestly, 
it was easy during the pandemic because there was nothing else happening in the building. Now the buildings, they have a theater downstairs. They're hoping to use it again. So honestly, we only have until January until we probably can't store anything in the building. Um, yeah, we've, we've had discussions about spending 300 to $3,000 on like a, uh, you know, build your own shed thing that we could attach to the building or, you know, the $3,000 end, we're looking at small shipping containers. Um, but yeah, with the, the facilities we're using, that doesn't really work for at the moment. That'd probably be a few years down the line. Um, but yeah, we, we have, ex, we have seen a few other locations that do food distributions and they usually have some freezers on site. Um, yeah, most of our organizations we're we have so few resources, spending a lot of that on storage right now doesn't feel very practical. Um, unless you are an organization that can put monthly resources towards storage, you can build and secure the facilities you have. Honestly, I would encourage our groups to be as resourceful as possible with everything you have. Um, try to move things day of if you can uh, shrink the amount of things you're keeping in storage. Um, yeah, we've been around since 1982 and I'm finding like saucers we served food on 25 years ago that I don't know why we still have. Um, we could, you know, we could just buy pizzas now for events and not have to worry about that stuff. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's just having the right items rather than lots of items has been the, the thing we're trying to figure out. Um, CFI is primarily an educational organization, of course, but they need to do charity too. Um, James Underdown, he's one of the most well-funded CFI branches. And uh, have, have you just said, hey, can we, could you ask CFI to buy us a freezer? They might, or find, he might find some movie star who buy it for you. James is so connected and all that. He's pretty connected. Um, yeah, they've got their own struggles. Um, so the parking lot that we do our food distribution in, uh, they've been trying to build for two and a half years and are in a lawsuit with the contractor, possibly, that they were working on for it. And I can't imagine how many hundreds of thousands that might cost and the retaining wall that'll go with it. Um, their income is related to how they use their building, um, which isn't affiliated with other organizations. So um, yeah, the, the story of the Hollywood branch of CFI is they had to move it two years ago. So we're at a different location than they used to have. And basically they've been building and improving the building for the past two and a half years and they're still not done. So us as a small renter has not asked them for major changes uh, until they actually are know what their vision for the building is yet but we're getting close we're in good communication i talk to them every week yeah i wonder if it's worth running um, a campaign potentially for you know just asking people to donate old freezers anything any storage units that they might have um people have those lying around i think like claire said earlier and potentially they would want to donate that um there's restaurants unfortunately, that have gone out of business during the pandemic, and they don't have use for those anymore either. So that might be a potentially low-cost way to, to get storage. Yeah, the building doesn't have anywhere inside we could put those right now. So those would be outdoor fridges <laughs> uh, attached mm. to someone's building. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I, we can get into the super detailed complications, but I like where you're all thinking. We're trying to solve a much larger problem, which is how can we serve more food? Um, the, so we've been having this conversation for about six months. How can we serve more food? And we feel like we've hit capacity on what we currently do with our volunteers and the resources we have. So our next goal has been to maybe find partners that we could send volunteers to. So we are looking to reach out to a lot of the other local churches and city food distributions and start building up better connections to see if we could get food more efficiently, if we can build stronger relationships. Um, and honestly, if we can send 10 people to someone else's food distribution, we're still actively participating in more distributions. We're learning more things as we go so that once we have the resources or the building that can expand our program or we can afford the trucks to expand our program 
um, will be ready. So we're still we're still newbies, even though we just hit a year, year and a half doing this. You're amazing. You really quickly. Oh, that was impressive. Sorry, Claire, were you? I was just being rude and interrupting and saying that Evan, what you're doing is amazing. It's fantastic. It is. It's cool. It was really exciting because honestly, it came from just a few volunteers in the organization. We were all having casual conversations of we can't do nothing during the pandemic. Like we can't sit on our hands. But the fact it turned into a full blown food distribution still blows me away. Um, you know, the city was more desperate than I thought, and all they needed was a few locations and a few hands, and we connected the dots. So, um, yeah, we went from an emergency site to a permanent site. So we're on their calendar for the next, I think, year or two. Um, yeah, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be, honestly. <laughs> a lot of work. I mean, we need over 10 volunteers every time we do it. And it's like uh, almost eight hours those days and we're in the hot sun this time of year. But uh, yeah, it's good work. Are you finding that uh, with things, I mean, at least I think things are maybe closing soon in your area again. But um, were you finding this summer that your volunteers were dropping off or what did it stay steady? No, I think it just comes and goes. Um, I do find that the more we promote, you know, if I could put a post up every other day for the month leading up, we have more volunteers than the months where I throw up one post the day before. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think constant promotion is one thing, but another is just coming and going to volunteer. So uh, this month we had only 10 volunteers, which was the lowest we've ever had. But the month before we had 22 volunteers, which is the most we've ever had an event. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, a local university, um, yeah, Concordia University's nursing program found us and they, students have a required amount of service hours they have to do to graduate. So. I'm trying to get in touch with the professor so we can be on their list of programs they send people to in the future, but that was an hour and a half drive for some of those students. Um, but we picked up three students that day, plus you know the stars aligned for the rest of our volunteers. Um, yeah, I mean, this month we happen to have our lead volunteers. Father died, so we had to fly back to the East Coast to plan uh, the arrangements. We had um, another volunteer or two have to back out last minute um, with health issues. So. I think people just come and go. What's core is having a core group that really knows what they're doing. So in case you knock out any one or two of the super planners, you can still have a functioning program. So in our case, we were, we lost basically the guy who founded the program, but we still pulled it off even with only 10 people. Um, it was messier, it was slower, <laughs> we sweat more than we should have, but um, yeah, that's, it was still a good program. Um, I do find, uh, one thing I've been doing is I do videos day of. Um, I've heard it's too late. So people see the videos where I'm going, hey, we need volunteers. Come on down. We're here from noon to five. I sound like a car salesman. Um, <laughs> but people have noticed those. I'm Actually, here, a lot of our Kevin. Go ahead, Neil. I'm, I'm, I'm literally here at the dealership as you beat up car salesmen. <laughs> I'm sorry to make fun of. I mean, I learn from the best is what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like we have... Uh, I, it is easy to build, but people are desperate to be involved in programs like this. So I find every time I do that, people write me afterwards, oh, I wish I could have joined. If I was free, I would have joined. So it is worth making the ask, uh, make a video, make a few posts, say we need volunteers, even if you think you have all of them, some won't show up. Um, so I really encourage people to go out of their way to do those extra promotions. I'm trying to get better about doing them a few days before the event, not just the day of when I feel like I have the time. Is it worth uh, tapping into other organizations as well? So they might not necessarily be Atheist United volunteers, but you, you mentioned you were working with um, a local school. So I think Food Rescue Alliance might have a few member organizations in, in the California area. I'd have to double check where they are, but like if you connected with them, potentially they could send volunteers your way as well. Um, yeah, one of the things we learned, uh, my local doctor's office uh, keeps a list of all food distributions in the region. Um, so I'm now trying to reach out to them to make sure we're on that list. And um, that suddenly tipped me off to all of these areas that are keeping lists of local food distributions and service providers like doctor's offices. So if you're a 
starting a new food distribution in a region, like there are organizations maybe from universities to doctor's offices that are keeping these lists and all you have to do is get on those lists and you suddenly have clients and probably volunteers. Um, we have, honestly, we've done so well with volunteers. We haven't felt a need to like really go out and recruit our next 50. Um, we have Jolie's meetup group that consistently brings us five to 10 new people every month. But um, yeah, honestly, that is a big question. If, if we like see a real hard lockdown again and people are scared to come back out, how we're going to get volunteers. Um, frankly, we did maybe better during lockdown times because it was the only thing people could do. It was the only thing people like ethically felt like they could put their time towards, um, even if it was a slight risk. As an observer down here in Los Angeles, I would say, Evan, that uh, it's, it really helps that it's consistently on those Fridays, um, yeah. that it, you know that it's happening. I mean, while I have obviously haven't been able to get uh, a Friday off to go down and join you guys, I know that it's happening in the background. And so if I can get one of those days off, it's going to be like my default thing to go and do, where I yeah. think if you're just doing it random Saturdays or random days during the week, um, you probably wouldn't see nearly that same kind of consistency. That, yep. that you're able to achieve being a thing that people just know that that's what's happening now. I have at least five people like Neil who have just said that though. They keep it on their calendar. The second they get a free Friday, they're coming. Um, so yeah, I agree. Consistency. We'll have to send you to the food bank with the people to pick up the food meal so they can leave the, the meats behind. That was a random question, actually, if we want to go off topic. Uh, has FPB been exploring new areas to try to push into? I know, actually, I think I can answer the question myself. I know you've honed in the mission uh, and the, like, um, the UN focus areas for the organization the past few years. And I guess the question would be, how's that going? And are you feeling any push or pull from groups about talking about other issues from animal ethics to climate change to... Uh, I don't know, children's education, for instance. Um, I mean, we haven't gotten, it seems groups are enthusiastic about where we're, we're putting our focus. Uh, in the past, we were doing so many different things. I don't feel like we were necessarily making as much of an impact. Um, and I think the one thing that does keep coming up is the disaster uh, program with climate change as well that people do want to see more of and they want to speak more about that. So we're really just trying to figure out how can we tie that into our mission now. Um, we don't want to get rid of it because it's such an effective program. And you know, I think Evan, you might have mentioned in the past potentially wanting to work with um, the, the wildfires that have been going on. So. I think that's really like the biggest topic that comes up for us. Um, and we're definitely working on that. We are very slow on it because we have such a small team, but um, one of the great ideas that Wendy has brought up, um, the backbone of our, pro of our Beyond Belief Network, she's brought up potentially like creating a guide um, in terms of like hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, wildfires, how can we, how can we um, mobilize or get teams to mobilize very quickly? on that. And so that's what we're trying to do in response to people um, pushing the discussion that way. Uh, but that's going to be some time in before we can really get that. Yeah, I mean, that's something we've been talking about a lot. But one of the things I, I really want to um, figure out when we're able to give good time to that piece of the puzzle is figuring out how to help teams be ready before the disaster strikes rather than trying to scramble when it happens and in the aftermath um, because it's so much more effective if you if you have a plan in place if you've got the connections et cetera et cetera so like that I really want to uh, focus on figuring out how we can help y'all know how to be best situated if you know the worst happens in your community um, or nearby. Are, are there other areas you'd like to see us focus on, Evan? We're one of your grant recipients. We're doing very well with uh, <laughs> your, your focus. <laughs> um, 
No, I'm just, I'm curious. We have the conversations all the time about what's the future of uh, humanist groups and atheist groups regionally. And, um, you know, we're seeing groups that are taking on more specific issues like Young Humanist International has a climate change program. And um, uh, I wholly expect vegan atheist groups to be a major part of atheist organizing of the next 50 years. Um, even if they're not like the face of current organizations and, and movement building. So I'm just thinking about who's going to work with those organizations and how, and uh, if FVB is hearing or feeling any pressure around those, but we're, we're actually doing fine. We're well positioned, uh, poverty, homelessness, hunger, huge problems in Los Angeles. We're gonna be spending time on for the next 50 years. I think it all ties together though, because when you look at climate change, right, it causes food shortages, um, poverty, that, that's all, all, you know, people who are impoverished feel climate change much more quickly. Um, they're less likely to recover. They're less likely to be able to access food when there's food shortages from that. Um, and then it can cause homelessness as um, people to become unhoused as well. So. So it, that ties in, um, and then in terms of animal rights, there are certain cultural groups, and of course, you know, people who are vegan but need food. Either way, um, how do we be inclusive of that? And especially since we're kind of uh, giving out whatever food we can get our hands on, um, right? Yeah. So those are those are definitely issues that are on our minds. How do we make it more sustainable? How do we scale that out? How do we address all these different problem areas in a way that is sustainable. Um, but it's, it's all in the works, right? as always. Well, and we're building the infrastructure. I mean, we've built a humanist method for how to respond to disasters. And we've built a humanist method now for how to like work with local groups that are um, aligned with our values. So, I mean, I like the plan you're working on, you know, maybe it's an, another organization that has to take on some of these other causes, and then you'll find ways to work together on the intersections. But um, being more focused, I think, will help you. I think, personally, I see too many organizations that are not focused enough. So uh, I'm not faulting you. I do think it helps um, to do those types of partnerships where, you know, we have something in common. There's uh, a project that intersects both our missions and being able to to work with another group um mostly because we don't all have the same resources and it doesn't make sense to if we do have the same resources to make them redundant it doesn't make sense to um have holes you know when we do that so some groups are more effective in certain cause areas than others Yeah, uh, Irene just uh, sent out a comment saying that she's glad that we're bringing up veganism and animal rights because it's it impacts human health, climate change, and habitat destruction, um, and it's also a social justice issue, the treatment of the animals. But yeah, everything overlaps. Um, I feel like there's a few people we haven't heard from tonight. I know, Sarah, if you have anything that's going on in Camp Quest that you want to talk about. Oh, um, sorry. I actually was just writing when I need to go. And I, I was kind of thinking I was here for our Oasis group because we're doing some stuff for you. Um, yeah. Um, Camp Quest, I don't know if I have any great news for y'all that's related to this. You know, we've just finished up our camp season and it's it went fairly well, I think as well as can be expected in this in this time. <laughs> but uh, uh, Neil might have more information on, on the West camps. But yeah, you know, we're, uh, I, I'm on the board of my local Oasis chapter and we've just started doing some of the volunteering um, for the Beyond Belief Network. And so we're looking to do something a little bit more regularly, but doing it in conjunction with a local educational farm that distributes produce. 
So we're talking to them about the best way to do that. And basically, because we're too small to organize anything by ourselves, that's any, uh, any bigger, uh, certainly nothing on the scale of what you all are doing in Los Angeles. But we are hoping to just get started and have something regular and become a part of this other distribution uh, that they can't manage on their own. And then, you know, hopefully eventually branch out into something else. Very cool. I love the direction that you're moving in. Well, um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. And now I'm out. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put anyone else on the spot if anyone else has anything they want to share about what their group is doing or any feedback. We definitely love to hear it. I don't have a specific thing I can ask you for. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about how we're going to ramp back up after COVID. We've, we've, uh, we had Zoom meetings for a while and they just, they just died out. You know, nobody was, I think it, people got Zoomed out some months ago. And so I, I don't know if how we're going to restart meetings and stuff. I don't know if there'll be anybody coming once we start having in-person meetings again. I don't know if you, if you folks have any suggestions for how to, I think some groups are just going to go out of business, you know, <laughs> during, from COVID. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the best way really is if you have a meeting set up, posting it. Um, I haven't mentioned it before, just posting it well in advance so that people can kind of schedule it in um, social posts. FBB can also help you with that. If there's something, a meeting you want to share, um, we can spotlight it. Um, potentially speaking with other groups that are in the area uh, and maybe having their members come as well to those in-person meetings uh, just to build more partnerships. Um, that's what I can think of off the top of my head. I also, one of uh, the things that I think new groups often um, kind of give up before giving it a chance. So they'll like have two meetings and two people show up. So they're like, oh, this didn't work. Um, and I rather than maybe giving it <laughs> six, seven meetings before making that call, I think, which is, I, I understand that that's a, the instinct of being like, oh, this didn't work. But I think that hopefully when you're able to have your in-person meetings uh, that you'll be able to, you know, give it a give it a few times to get people used to it and, and finally be able to get out and come to them will help. But also with you all, I, I, I know I understand your concern, but I feel like uh, since you have such established events that have have continued through the pandemic, I feel like you all are in a really good place to um, to bounce back. Well, yes and no. It's sort of a best of times and worst of times. Yeah. Our, our regular recurring events, and there are three main organizations we work with, Adaptive Sports Connection and uh, Ronald McDonald House, and our local homeless shelter. Um, we did keep doing those. Our leaders kept showing up and keeping it going when they would allow us in. You know, if they, we always, you know, go by there. If the shelter doesn't want volunteers or something, we, we don't. But um, so that's, that's gone well and we kept that going, although we haven't added new members. In fact, we made a decision early in the COVID uh, quarantines that, you know, we didn't want to, things like Ronald McDonald House, I can go and clean a room by myself wearing a mask and gloves and all that. And, I'm, and I've done that every month during the pandemic and felt safe, but I didn't want to train somebody. They would have to be in the room with me and <laughs> all that. And so we kind of put on hold letting new people get involved with it. And we didn't try to recruit new people. So it's our regulars that have kept that going um, and already have a relationship sort of with those those groups, the, the people with disabilities we help at Adaptive Sports Connection or, uh, you know, the people we work with in the kitchen at the shelter and stuff. But um, I'm, I'm concerned about ramping it back up and getting, getting recruiting going and getting discussion meetings uh, because that those social meetings are where we uh, 
sort of recruit and announce things and uh, get some enthusiasm going. So. I may be able to, to say, as Sarah had mentioned, I just, uh, we just did Camp Quest at the end of July down here in Southern California. So I was a camp director for that. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, but I can say that, you know, while I was a little bit smaller group this year, especially with unvaccinated kids, not everyone was comfortable quite coming back yet. Uh, we're lucky that it happened in July as opposed to now with Delta going on. It was kind of a, a much different scenario. Uh, but the people who came back really needed camp uh, and really needed that interaction and really needed those things. So uh, while I hear everyone might be getting rusty, might be getting out of practice, might have a little bit of hesitations, I think once things eventually get to the point uh, of Delta, Zeta, whatever things that we come through next, um, that it's going to come back with a, with a, a vengeance. And people that you probably only saw once or twice a year coming out to volunteer are suddenly going to be looking for that new, uh, that new place to belong, that new routine. Uh, and so there's, there's been a whole lot of resetting of routines that I think is going to be, um, I don't want to say beneficial, but you know, that groups who are offering events will be able to take, care, uh, take advantage of uh, and get those volunteers for. Yeah, I want to piggyback that we have a while we have a very big food distribution and we have a very large organization in general, we have a lot of very small meetups around Los Angeles and those are having the exact conversations you're having right now. And um, yeah, it's it's kind of complicated and not safe at this moment in time. But if numbers were going back down, if we have booster shots in arms, like I think if we're able to, I would try to find a way to have some in-person events, do them outside, do them in a park. You know, we did a volunteer appreciation party in the park, probably at the perfect time in this uh, kind of resurgence. Um, you know, you can have a distanced cookout in a park where people can feel like they saw each other um, you require vaccinations to be there. Honestly, one thing I've been learning is high schoolers, they have to get tested once a week. We can go back to being tested once a week if we need to. You can require testing for your events um, if you want. So we're looking at how to do a winter solstice at the end of the year. And as of right now, it's going to be vaccinations and negative COVID tests to get in. Um, you know, you can set higher and higher standards for your events, but I agree with, you know, people are craving it, they need it, and it does reboost the energy for your group. I think it might even help your online meetings. Um, there's something to knowing there's just going to be six to 12 months of online meetings that I think makes it a little harder for people to feel energized unless they're an organizer or a diehard, but, um, yeah, just one or two in-person events on the calendar. That's what I'm going for right now with my group. We're planning a camping trip to Death Valley as one of the events on the calendar. We're probably going to do one outdoor like birthday party for the group. And then we've got a winter solstice party in December. So maybe one event a month right now. And we might cancel some of those. But just having something on the calendar, uh, even if it's far out, I think helps a little bit. Park in Death Valley sounds a lot. Yeah, yeah. If anyone wants to come, we're grabbing the uh, uh, Camp Quest West president. Uh, she gives a killer star talk, supposedly. And uh, yeah, camping trip. And the moon sets at like seven o'clock at night. So we'll have a perfect view of the stars. Um, yeah, come camping with us. Yeah. I wish I were in California. Definitely would go to that one. Um, Great time for a road trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think also it helps, uh, this probably won't help too much with recruiting, but once you get volunteers in the door to have some sort of guide so that you don't necessarily have to really be hands-on training them. Um, Wendy and I were, uh, working on a guide for our, our own volunteers with FPB, um, who, you know, come in and help us with administrative tests that it's just a lot easier and removes the friction and gets them coming in again and again, um, more than once, you know, more consistently once they, they sort of have that. And that's also something that can be easily shared. If you get one volunteer in the door, they can share it with someone in their network and their party um, that they personally know. And someone looking at this is like, oh, this is easy. I can do this. Um, so that might also help. Um, or, or I just want to give everyone a last chance to don't want to put anyone on the spot. Um, but if last chance, if anyone wants to speak or last thoughts.
Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know, I think everyone here is probably from BBN, um, but we are live streaming. So for anyone who is watching or who will watch a recorded video, please, please donate. Any amount helps. Um, text FBB to 44321. Your money helps to support all these wonderful teams that are here tonight. Uh, and for all you BBN teams, any feedback you have, anything you really like, anything you wish we could do better or would offer, uh, feel free to send an email over to Wendy, that's wendy at foundationbeyondbelief.org, or to myself, that's tiff, T-I-F, at foundationbeyondbelief.org. Um, I'll drop that in the chat. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the work you do and for also coming tonight. I'm just our emails are in the chat. All right, thank you.